evening. Um, I'm glad to see more than three people, which is what I expected. Um, and I'm very, uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Professors Avya Sundaram and Dr. Gil Bedhari. So, welcome to an evening of ecstatic Shaiva Bhakti, experimental Jaina prose in Kannada. Um, let me introduce uh, two scholars whom I've learned very, mu very much from. Uh, Professor Arya Sundaram is uh, like a guru to me. He's a man for all seasons. You can speak to him about classical Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Sanskrit literature. You can talk to him about the Gambara poets of abuse uh, in the 20th century. He has his fingers in all pies. Um, he is former director of the Kuwempu uh, Kannada Adhyana Sanskrit in Mysore University. And he has collaborated with a uh, number of people uh, on translations including the Andhra Shabda Chintamani, very importantly the Kaviraja Marga, one of the oldest poetic treatises in India, uh, the Gada Yudha and uh, the Vada Radhani as well, that's a forthcoming publication. Um, and his long-time collaborator is Dr. Gil Ben Hiru. They've been working on Harihara's Rabelais. Um, Dr. Uh, Gill's research interests include Kannada language, South Asian bhakti devotional traditions, and uh, the vernacularization of Sanskrit poetics and courtly poetry. He has an elegant, robust book uh, called Shiva's Saints, The Origins of Devotion in Kannada, according to Harihara Zanagalini. Um, that's an OUP publication. I recommend that you pick it up if you can. Um, we know that uh, Harihara is a 13th century poet in Kannada and his Rabelais uh, include the earliest biographies of the Kannada Shaiva saints. Um, what is interesting I think for us is that when we speak about translation today, we typically tend to desire an immediate recognition and uh, relevance in the translation. For example, the vachanas to us seem very relevant today, they speak to our contemporary times. Or the Bhagavad Gita can be used by management students, for example. But I want to use this opportunity because we have two scholars who spent uh, most of their lives in the university to move away from the idea of relevance when we think about Harihara's reverence. Um, what can we do instead? We can perhaps think about why Harihara's Ravalis are have been obscured by later Vachana Sahitya. Why is it that we know the Vachanas in Kannada, in English translations, in Indian literature so much better than this fantastic, sophisticated 13th century poet from whom we get our first narratives about the same Shaiva saints? And the second thing before I open up the discussion is uh, to think about how translators today are becoming more and more recognized. And this is an opportunity for us to think about translation, its relevance, uh, how translations communicate across audiences and languages, uh, rather than think about, oh, we haven't been able to capture these things, right? Um, it's always a privilege to speak and listen to someone who has worked very closely with languages. Um, and so with that, I think I'll, we'll open our discussion. What we will do is uh, half an hour for each speaker. And then usually the person with the mic tends to have a lot of power, but I will uh, disabuse myself of that power and open it up for discussion and we can take questions after. Mm -hmm. Professor Sundaram. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Today, um, it's an encounter with uh, the authors of old Kannada texts. Sometimes it is uh, definitely an encounter. And I prefer to call it a conversation with uh, old Kannada uh, scholars or uh, authors. And better to call it reflections of a dream because definitely it is a dream 
in our lifetime to introduce this uh, old Kannada poets to the modern world. That is what uh, today's uh, caption says that uh, you are traveling from old Kannada uh, to modern uh, uh, Kannada. And we are all translators because um, uh, we translate our thoughts into speech. And also, if you want to translate, if I speak in English, I am translating uh, from uh, one of the Indian languages in English. Maybe you are mother tongue and uh, sometimes uh, other language, like Kannada, for example. You know, people ask me, in what language you think? So we generally think in our mother tongue. But sometimes, if you are very proficient in some other language, I, I think, I, sometimes my thoughts, they come from Kannada. So we are all translating from uh, the Sindhi languages. Whenever we are doing some translation, uh, or when we are speaking in English, we are translating. And translating old Kannada texts is a little more difficult because See, it borrowed hundreds and thousands of words from Sanskrit. And when you have Sanskrit words, each word in Sanskrit has at least ten meanings. That is the difficulty. So you have to fix the meaning of each and every word if you are uh, selecting uh, an old Kannada text. That is the most difficult part of it. So I take it in three levels. Number one is world level. So you have to have a lexico, lexical knowledge to uh, fix the meanings of the words, especially when you are uh, selecting an old Kannada text. That is one thing. And secondly, sentence level. Because even syntactically, Sanskrit is entirely different from uh, Kannada. And English, it is also an Indo-European language and when you are translating into Sanskrit or English, this is the same. Because this is a syntactical level, you have so many difficulties. And I am wondering how our poets in Kannada and also in Telugu, how they could do it with so much of proficiency from Sanskrit. And and we are, we are now familiar with the such stylistic features in old Kannada texts. So they translated from Sanskrit, which is entirely different from Kannada. And in the world or syntactical or cultural level also, it is all different. But even then they succeeded in introducing this text to Kannada audience. So this is how these three levels, and the one is world level, and uh, another is a syntactical level, and another is cultural level. That's the most important thing, because it's very difficult to translate from Kannada or Sanskrit into any other language when uh, you have so many cultural uh, all these uh, new uses, and uh, you cannot translate sometimes. So with some examples, I am going to present some of these uh, difficulties we encountered when we have taken up this translation. And for uh, a language teacher like me, <laughs> it is a little more difficult because, see, most of the language teachers, you know, uh, they, they, they are proficient in their own language. <laughs> and uh, if you take Kannada professors, uh, Telugu professors, and other uh, these language teachers in India, most of them are not familiar with uh, uh, what do you call uh, the, the, uh, the essence of uh, this uh, English language or uh, the, uh, the stylistic features of English language. That's why I, I thought it was better to have some collaboration. Always it is better to have collaboration when you are translating 
this uh, classical Kannada text in English. So I am fortunate to have some of them, like Devan Patel, uh, who is a Native American, um, and uh, he has his uh, um, MA in English from Columbia University, and he is a Sanskrit professor. So when you are translating a text like Kaviraj Marga, uh, which is uh, full of uh, Sanskrit uh, uh, words of poetics, then you need uh, definitely help of uh, uh, someone like Devan Patil. <laughs> and uh, for Gadayita, I have taken our own Amal Sharam, who was born in English. So he was uh, brought up in English. So that's why um, I have taken the help of uh, Amal Sharam when I was translating Gadayita into English. And similarly for Vattaradhani, the other text, you need a Jain scholar unless you have one uh, person from Jainology, it's very difficult to translate uh, this Vattaradhani. That's why you have Subhachandra who was professor of uh, Jainology and Prakrat uh, at the University of Mysore who I collaborated with him and also another uh, formulation who is from the Department of English. <laughs> so that is how we maintained this uh, process of uh, translation from classical Kannada into English things. So coming to Vattara. Uh, these all these texts, one is Kaviraj Marka, Vattara, Gadayita, and uh, also we have another text for poetics with uh, Gil, and we are now doing this regularly. They are all different classical texts. Uh, you take the metrical composition or uh, this uh, classical text uh, genre and uh, uh, the disciplines to which they belong. All these are different. One is poetics and one is epic and uh, another is a prose work and another is a grammar, like this, there are different texts. So, Vatarana is a problematic text. Uh, and an excellent prose work of uh, uh, the, that is the earliest prose work in Canada. Uh, probably 10th century, some of them, they say 7th, 6th, like that. And some of them place uh, it in 12th or 13th century. But probably it is a 10th century text. And that is the earliest text in Kannada. I think even prior to Pandu Bharata. And that is also one of the earliest prose texts in narrative with some unique qualities. Because it is more an oral text than a written text. And there is a, see, historically speaking, uh, it's very interesting, you know. There was one text of first century AD, and um, we don't know the, whether Ashokotya Acharya or somebody, Bhagavati Aradhana. And in that Prakrit text, you have certain uh, Gaha. Gaha is a meter in Prakrit. And there are 19 Gahas in uh, that Bhagavati Aradhana. And they are couplets. And they give you the gist of or essence of the achievements of 19 ascetics, Jaina ascetics. If you read those, uh, the small gahas, then you will know uh, the I mean, characteristic feature of a great ascetic, Jaina ascetic. And you know, from first century onwards, it seems, Kannada people, they took up this task of explaining these gahas to their audience. And they narrated the life history of these 19 ascetics. It was going on. 
I think it was orally that because you know, the nature of the text, if you observe, it's more of uh, like uh, an oral text or folk text because there are several folk motifs in this uh, uh, text. So that was going on. And at some point of time, they recorded the text and they made it a written text. It might have been in the 10th century. So there is no one author. We say Shokote Acharya is the author. We don't know whether he made it a written text or not. But it was going on. That's why it has a wonderful tradition of about 800 to 900 years that the narrating the stories of these Jaina aspects. So that's why really, it's a wonderful text. And also the most difficult one. Uh, because uh, all these texts, you know, not only what are the name, these classical texts, uh, you start with the, the uh, title of the text. Uh, each one gives you much difficult to translate it. And you know, what are the in the entire Kannada literature, that is the only text having such a title. Such a title means Vata is Kannada or Tadbhava, that is derivative from Sanskrit or Prakrit. Aradhana is Sanskrit. And you are not expected to mix these two. Kaviraj Marga clearly says you should not mix Sanskrit and the Kannada words and the big compounds. In the entire Kannada literature, you don't find any other title with uh, such a mixture of uh, this uh, derivative and uh, one Sanskrit word. You don't know how scholars accepted it. There are other titles also for what are other names, but it has become popular, we cannot help it. And Vata, uh, immediately Kannada people, Vata means uh, one uh, set of people <laughs> migrated from uh, Odia. <laughs> Vata means from Odra. So that is what I am saying. Each word, <laughs> it has multiple meanings. <laughs> So immediately what the water <laughs> means in Canada, they are water people, uh, stone, uh, stone bakers. And what the, you don't know from, uh, is it from Vruddha? So immediately scholars say it is from Vruddha Radhani. Vruddha means elderly person. Uh, it refers to our ascetics, genus. And Hampa Nagaraja, a scholar, mm -hmm. is a Jaina scholar, he says it is from Bhurhadarada. He says Bhurhat, that is vast, uh, uh, great Aradhana. Uh, he says it is from, but uh, he is a linguist. And how can you support that uh, Buddha comes from Bhurhat? <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> so nearest one is Buddha. Not uh, this Bruhat, Vada from Bruhat. So we decided to translate it means uh, veneration to the elders. But Aradhana, Aradhana generally in the Kannada, Aradhana means paying respects to elderly people, dead, <laughs> those who are dead. But here it is not like that. And Aradhana also means worshipping somebody or giving respects to somebody. But in Jaina context, the first thing Shubha Chandra was saying, hey, no, 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 you are, it is, that is not the meaning of Aradhana. In the Jaina context, Ayan Upachya, who is a great scholar, he wrote about Aradhana. He says, it is a status to be attained. Aradhana means it is a status to be attained through 
सम्यक ज्ञान सम्यक चारित्र ज्ञानेज चारित्र Generally, Chaitra means history, <coughs> but uh, Chaitra means Kanda. So, Aradhana has that special meaning. And how to bring it? <laughs> See, if you say the status of somebody that attained uh, some status by having uh, all these qualities, how to bring it in the title? Oh, simply, you have to say veneration to the others. And that conveys the meaning because you have the stories or narratives about the Jain ascetics. Well, it fits in. So somehow you have to adjust. So it starts from the, the fixing the title itself. So here and there are others. Uh, when you are translating it into English. The first sentence itself is Annika Putrana Kathayan Pedvan. That Pedvan means uh, I will say, I, I will talk something, I will say something. That means it may be a moral this thing. And Pedvan sometimes even for written text also we say, oh, I say something. <laughs> But how to see actually when you translate it, you have to translate Annika Putrana Kathayan Pedvan. I will now tell you the story of Vadika Putra. <laughs> But our English professor, he said, no, no, that is not the way you should see. It should be, let me narrate the story of Vadika Putra. That's better, he said. So that is how, even in sentence level, you have to take into consideration this English audience and how it will be somewhat natural to Uh, convey this meaning. So, you, if you go through this uh, this uh, sentence, the other day, Anamala was telling me, she also um, is interested in translating Vadaradhana. See, this Vadaradhana this Vadaradhana is like Sesem and Lilis in English. So you have sentences, uh, uninterrupted sentences, and one page becomes a sentence. And how to translate it? If you have one page of English translation, a sentence in English, uh, is it the modern English? Are you facing modern audience? Are you going to narrate the same story to the modern audience? Again, it is a, see, we have to break the sentences. So here, I will uh, tell you this. Uh, and another thing is, there are one or two other translators of Vataratna. They have taken only the story part. And also, even our, uh, uh, that, uh, what we have in collaboration with English professor, he has his own translation, he sent us the translation. And uh, most part of this uh, narration no, is not there. <laughs> so he, he converts it into English and he takes it as a story. But it is not just a story. <laughs> it is actually a narrative representing a Jaina ascetic of some first century or uh, uh, given prayer. Mahavira, who was the 5th century or 6th century BC, such people. And it starts with uh, this uh, Prakrita Gaha, and they omit that Prakrita Gaha because it is very difficult to understand this Prakrita. And uh, they all omit this, but uh, we have not done that. We have taken it. Dear Narsimacha, he gives the meanings of uh, this Prakrita Gaha also. 
even in the original text also you have the meaning of the prakrit ga you have to do it because you have to show that how this narrative develops into a uh, a long story uh, representing the this uh, aspects of their life so that is why we have taken up that the translation of that ga and then see there are many words here. see i wonder sometimes see ma uh, even our uh, the other friend he doesn't know some of the kannada words which were prevalent in those days in the century which are equal to telugu words <laughs> it's very funny <laughs> but it is true See, even uh, we were uh, dealing with this ragale. Sometimes so we got some of the words, archaic words, which are now in Tamil or the Telugu. <laughs> and when if you know these languages, you can easily understand. Nowadays in Kannada, wife means you translate it as sati, no? sati. But bharya, though it is Sanskrit. it is not in use in uh, kannada no but it is very much there in telugu <laughs> so bharya wherever you get a wife here you get to bharya <laughs> not to sati <laughs> so immediately you can catch it when you know other languages and sometimes the difficulty another difficulty is for example mahadevi <laughs> Uh, Mahadevi or Patta Mahishi. <laughs> Mahishi is a sheep of your own. Ten minutes. Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay. You tell me in nine minutes. Eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so these uh, some of these words, Mahadevi, Mahishi, Baba recommended the uh, Dotting Queen. <laughs> Uh, and also all queens are equal but in indian context it is not like that. maharani is different from other uh, queens so you cannot uh, translate it as uh, just a queen uh, these are not some of that and uh, also as in this narrative there are some repetitions so for example whenever when ascetic he goes on voyage he travels there is a uh, the same repetition of the same type of this thing which is a characteristic feature of an oral text for example when when they when they go on my like they go uh, wander in uh, villages cities folk towns wall towns border towns port towns and coastal cities at least you will get the same thing at least 20 to 25 times in matter and this is all in a narrative feature of such text okay and then uh, coming to the next uh, Uh, epic which uh, we have translated that is gada here also the same thing gada is not tetta the club are mes in english so there is a very good description of gada in uh, gada it's a wonderful uh, this preparation with uh, so many colors and uh, uh, height weight uh, what the length of the gada width of the gada all these things he gives you the details and such gadas are not there in english and what you call it club it is donne like in kannada <laughs> and if you call it mess it is uh, demons use uh, such mess in indian context so you cannot have gada in sanskrit in english 
So that is why we struggled with that. But first uh, we, we started with the uh, club fight. <laughs> then uh, finally we won. And the first, uh, this uh, first one. There is, uh, in Samskar, you have some, um, what do you call that, is slesha. And the slesha means hugging. But uh, slesha in uh, Sanskrit, it is uh, an alankara, that is a uh, figure of uh, it is one of the figures of speech. And there you have multiple meanings to a single word or a sentence or even a verse. So that is called slesha. So you have you have to deal with uh, multiple meanings. If there are two meanings, it is double meaning. But there are anekartha kartyas. You have multiple. You have Ramayana, Mahabharata, Nada Chetra, and Mahabharata in one uh, epic. So you have to get the meanings. And uh, Gadalita starts with such. Sri Yuvati Priyam, Balayatam. Balarapaham. Each one of them have two meanings. One refers to the Puranic or mythological meaning, and another refers to his own pattern. <laughs> so unless you know Sanskrit, and also if you, unless you have that lexical knowledge, you cannot translate. That is the thing. Even it starts with the Sri. Sri has ten meanings. Sri is both uh, nectar and also poison. <laughs> Sri Kanta means there it is poison. And uh, Sri is Lakshmi, prosperity, everything. <laughs> so that's why how to translate. So unless you know the context and unless you know the tradition of uh, this beginning the anything with the Sri, it's not there in some school. And uh, in Kannada and the Telugu, exclusively all the epics, they start with the Sri. And they think the Sri is not only Lakshmi, but also prosperity, auspicious, everything. So that's why you have to bear in mind all this thing. And then, even in a Jaina epic, he is having the Vishnu here. Because his patron is Narayana. He has to bring the Vishnu. And the Vishnu, he is there in Sanskrit, the Jaina uh, literature as Vasudeva. So Vasudeva is there, Balarama is there. So he is now thinking about Vasudeva. And he is presenting the, the Vasudeva in the form of Vishnu. And he has one advantage. The Vishnu is actually the uh, a king house. Na Vishnu Prithivi Patihi. Unless he is a Vishnu, he cannot be a king. Vishnu means all pervading, uh, he extends his uh, uh, frontiers. So that is why it is also, it has the, those two meanings. So he takes the advantage of these meanings and he constructs a uh, the beginning verse, that is Mangala, uh, that the Padya, with uh, both the meanings. So we have no other way except that you give both the meanings. You cannot give it in one uh, verse, and otherwise you have to do it in parentheses, it is awkward to help. So you divide it, and he has uh, two minds. One mind is working for Vasudeva and one mind is working for his own pet. So this is a feature in uh, Pampa Bharata and Bhagavad because they, they uh, took uh, their patterns as uh, equal to uh, God. So that's why they, they, they are, um, somehow they adjusted it uh, with the help of uh, some school. So that is how it goes on. We have, uh, I don't have time to present all these things, but uh, uh, the next one also, 
It's a wonderful verse. See, he is uh, uh, presenting you the Shiva who had uh, so many qualities. But ultimately, he is uh, saying that he is Chaitya Narayan. <laughs> and there, he is embracing Gauri, Parvati. But he is Chaitya Narayan. How can it be? <laughs> it's a really wonderful verse. Uh, because uh, Shiva is Ardhana Ishwara. <laughs> so half of his body is Gauri. <laughs> and he is also, half of him is Vishnu also. <laughs> Shivaya, Vishnu Rupaya. <laughs> Shiva Rupaya, Vishnu. Then where is Shiva? <laughs> See, half of him is uh, Gauri and half of him is uh, Vishnu. Uh, but where is Shiva? But both of them put together is Shiva. Uh, and he is also Narayana. You know? So he is bringing everything here. He is actually praising Shiva, but indirectly he is bringing Narayana also. This is how it goes. Uh, this is the excellence of uh, our practice. And finally, I will um, say a few words about uh, Kaviraj Bhakti. They are also the same thing. See, in some school, you have uh, multiple choices of uh, uh, getting the meaning. See, Kaviraja Marga, is it Kaviraja Marga or Kavi Raja Marga? You can have both. So we have this uh, the way of the king of poets. But it may be the royal path for poets. You can have you know, both meanings. So we have to select one meaning. Uh, well, and there is a difference of opinion among the scholars also, whether it is uh, Kaviraja Marga or Kaviraja Marga. Everything is like that. See, in uh, poetics, uh, see, you take uh, this uh, Vishadavarne, for example. You cannot translate some of them. Saraswati. How do you translate? You have to take Saraswati. And similarly, Hamsa. So we have different uh, this thing, Indian books, and uh, it's better to call it Hamsa word. Because here in this particular verse, it is uh, the First one, Vishadavarne, etc. Hamsi man manasatul. Unless you have the concept of manasasarovara, which is not in the outside but the inside. So you have manasarovara in your mind itself, and there is a hamsa sitting there in manasarovara. So you have to have this manasa as mind and also this manasarovara. And the hamsas which are there roaming about are uh, the, that uh, particular manasa lake. So that is how uh, in uh, this uh, um, Kaviraja Marka also, each and every world gives you uh, some challenge. So it is challenging and uh, to bring it in uh, modern Kannada. And that also, you know, Sir Sheldon Pollock, when he looked at our translation, he said, whenever you have examples, you have to translate them into poetry, not prose. So when you are translating a work of poetics, there are two things. One is defining something, and it can be rendered into prose, but when you have something, some examples, which they are poetic, then what to do? We have to do it in poetry. That's why we have done this Gadayita in mostly poetic because it is poetry. It depends. So this is how our uh, this uh, translation of uh, these works went on. And uh, we are waiting for uh, response from uh, the readers. Um, they hope 
challenges that we translators encounter and also expand, I think, the realm of reference into new audiences outside of India with that particular uh, set of issues that we as translators need uh, to address. Uh, maybe just to repeat in general terms, I'm uh, involved with uh, Professor Sundaram for the last 10 years um, in, in working on Old Canada, and particularly paying focus to one text um, by this 13th century poet Harihara. I will say a few things about this poet and its, his significance in the history of Canada. And we are now uh, working on a translation project that is uh, one was awarded the grant by the American Academy of Religion for uh, international collaboration. Um, for the purpose of publishing this text in an English translation. My uh, lecture is basically made of uh, three elements. The first is to introduce, in general terms, the uh, Ragalegalu, the text composed by Harihara, and the importance of this text at that particular moment in time, in the early 13th century. The second part of my lecture will address general issues involved in translating this text that will very much connect uh, with uh, Professor Sundaram's uh, remarks about the other translation projects he presented here. And the third part will be showing you some examples from our translation, working translation. Um, so maybe a word about uh, the historical significance of Harihara uh, Ragalegalo. These are some of the publications uh, that uh, Professor Sundaram referred to, Kaviraja Margam Gadavida and Wadada Nenezra, rolling out of publication. And uh, this is uh, my book that came out last year with uh, Oxford University Press and also in uh, Oxford, India. So it's available here. Um, why is uh, the Ragalegalo an important text? Um, appearing in the early 13th century, uh, the Regalegalu, or it's a word that is not titled actually, we can call it Regalegalu, just a plural form of Ragale, a name of a meter, right? Uh, other uh, editors in the 20th century have given it different names, um, Shiva Sharanara Regalegalu, um, which Ragale stories about Shiva's Sharanas or saints and other titles. But this work really introduced a major change in Canada literature in the moment it appeared. Um, we are all familiar and very much uh, focused on vachanas, which are roughly dated um, in the 12th century. Um, and, and, and vachanas are very modern, some of them are very extreme and radical, also in their poetic form, um, but the first work to present radical changes in literary style is the Regalegalu, because the Vachanas were composed orally, they were carried orally, and, and in, in many ways they were outside of the literary circles of Canada. We don't get any reference to Vachanas until very late, uh, almost early modernity when Vachanas are being referred to by poets. Um, Harihara, in contrast, was well-versed in the classical uh, style of Canada, Champu, which some of the works here were composed. Um, and he composed the Champu, Kavya. It's kind of very learned, Sanskrit-based creation, very complicated to read. And then he composed this thing, 
right, the Rekalegado, which deviated radically from anything that was earlier being written in Canada, right? It's a whole work, long work, with long stories, written basically with one simple meter called Ragale, right? And it's a simple meter. I will demonstrate later um, uh, the uniqueness of its simple form. So that is a kind of a literary significance, but as Amel uh, told us earlier, there is a, 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 more, a more ideological importance right, attached to the Ragalegalo. The first text that tells us about the Kannada Sharanas, right, the, the Vachanakaras and their fellows, right, those early Bhaktas of the 12th century, who mm. composed Vajanas, but also mm. fought for and imagined a new society, mm. right? And understood worship of Shiva in new ways that weren't there before. So when we think about Basavana, Allama Prabhu, Akka Mahadevi, and all of these, these uh, amazing figures, right? Immediately we think about their lives. Maybe about their miracles, maybe about the vachanas that they composed, the uniqueness that each one of these figures carries. Harihara was the first to understand this. Harihara was the first one to sit down and compose their life story. And he did a lot of other things also. But when we look at the Ragalegaru as this um, literary package, right? we get something radically new. We get a new message in Canada literature. And that message is the message of devotion, right, of bhakti, um, which uh, for Harihara can be lived in many different ways. Right? And we are getting nearer to the significance because in the following centuries, with the appearance of other texts that talk about Vasavana, Adama Prabhu, the whole Kalyana Fellowship, we get a vision which is different than what Harihara saw and what Harihara described. Um, just to give you a very uh, 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 minimal example, the Ragalegalu is a vast corpus. Not even once in the Ragalegalu we find the word Virashaiva or the word Lingayat. Words that today we come to identify with the 12th century Vachanakaras. So if we have the first poet to tell us about the lives of Basavana, of Alama Prabhu and others, without mentioning that, those words, right? Which, which, what do they signify? They signify a certain religious tradition, right? With a certain set of practices, with a certain set of theology, and much more, a certain set of matters. For Harihara, all those do not exist in his own vision, in the early 13th century. So, the tradition evolved in ways that today, when we look backward, we don't see all the layers and the historical changes that the tradition had undergone throughout the ages. And this is what I mean when I say the significance of Harihara. So, an important poet, right? A new vision, new stories, a new literary style, and he even starts a new legacy, right? Because his nephew, Raghavanka, who was lately translated here, fortunately, by Vana Mala, who is with us, Raghavanka composes one of the most canonical works in Canada, and he again does it in a new literary style. So this, this, this 13th century is such an exciting moment, right? Within the literary circles, within the, the circle of literary composition. And, and this is our project, project and our focus in uh, this work about the 13th century and all these connections of different uh, kinds of literatures. Some of these issues I've discussed in my book, which is a monograph, which is an argumentative, academic, scholarly argument. But, but when, when I finished that book, I, I felt unsatisfied. I felt Something is, is still untreated with Harihara, and that untreated element is exactly the translation. The translation, this idea that the stories of the Shodanas should become available. First of all, they need to become available to modern Canada speakers, right? Who is, who is this kind of 
Are they Canada, Naru Canada? It doesn't matter. Those old registers of the language are generally not accessible to them. So there is a kind of a significance to tell these stories as they were composed in the 17th century. But I have a different sense as well, and this is a major element that I want to stress, bless you. I want to address in, the, in this lecture is that uh, these stories are beautiful as stories of devotion and of sanctity, of sainthood. And for that reason, they could appeal to different audiences outside of India. Right? Just as other classical works in, in, in Indian languages, from Sanskrit to all the, from to regional to Prakrit, also appeal to other audiences, this work has that potential. And uh, maybe I'll explain why later on. Or, or I'll touch it on it right now. I teach uh, uh, Indian religions in the North American classroom, right? which means that most of my students, in my case, it can change from place to place, most of my students are not Indian descendants, are not informed about Hinduism or this tradition. And I teach to them different devotional traditions. And, and each devotional tradition carries its own register, its own style, its own poetry, its own ideology. Right? And we, we see different things in different places at different times in the subcontinent, in the, mostly the second millennium. What I find peculiar and interesting and wonderful about the Regalegalo is this style of narration that he develops. Hand with hand with this meter, which is very simple, his stories are very clearly conveyed. Okay? They're somewhat different than what we expect of a classical Indian text in that sense. Right? They do not digress to long descriptions, right? or they do not involve complicated subplots which are all great, um, um, the part of the culture. But they have some kind of simplicity and direct and unfolding of the plot, which I believe is compelling for other audiences as well. And that was a major uh, motivation in embarking on, on this translation. Um, now speaking about the translation, uh, and speaking about A.K. Ramanujan, who, who was a major wonderful poet in English, and a translator from Sanskrit, Tamil, Kannada, and, and, and a scholar, right, with an amazing body of, 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 of work that he developed. And in an article that he discussed, he reflected about his translation work. He commented, he kind of quoted this famous expression, traditore traditore, it's in Italian, right, it means translator, is traitor, right? Traditore, traditore. And, 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 and even now, when I translated that from Italian to English, something got lost. I don't know if you noticed, right? That there's a nice musicality to the Italian origin. We're moving to, to English. Translator is a traitor. It's nice. Some of the musicality is kept, some of it is lost also. What's happening here, right? Why is the translator a traitor? Which is a very harsh expression, but but, but Ramanujan explained it, right? He explained the fact that when you go into this work of translating a text, you, you will get uh, the short end of the stick on both ends, right? It's very hard to satisfy the source culture and the target culture at the same time. And, and, and most of the time, you'll find yourself balancing between those two ends, right? And, and this is something that I want to to unpack here. Um, I mean, what is the original here that we're working? 13th century Canada, right? First of all, we don't have access to the audience. We don't have any evidence for the... There are no commentaries for this text, right? There is no live tradition today of, of Ragalegalu being performed, right? It's just kind of... They are being read in Matas. You know, I visited, I heard, but it's not the original tradition. So we don't know the origin to begin with, how they were read, how they were explained to people, what people thought of them. So that's one end of the state that we're not sure of. And then we have modern Canada readers who do not have direct access to that text, right? So that, that's on, on one side that is very hard to get access to. The other side, the target audience of the English readers, is also complicated, right? So who are the English readers 
that we imagine this, this publication and other of our work, right? First of all, the Indian readers, right? For them, in English is a native language. Some of them, is their mother tongue, right? There is a special kind of English developed here. There is a special culture of translation, of composing in English in India with its own idioms, with its own familiarity. And that is one audience. And then if, but then if we move a little bit further, Western audiences, European, North American audiences, read some of the same materials, some of different materials, and for them English is something a little bit different. With the Indian readers of English translating a classical text, I mean, if we, if we, Vanamala just told me about the wonderful graph she presented, right, about the distance from the original text, from Canada, right? Canada to Telugu, right, on the graph, it's, it's somewhat a short distance, right? And then Canada, maybe to Tamil, is a little bit more, Malayalam, right? Canada to English, but then you have, you know, Canada to, to Polish, right? And Canada to, who knows what we can add there. With, I want to say, do the same thing within the English range. So from Canada to the Indian reader of English, it's, it's, it's quite a short distance. It's difficult, but it's a short distance. Why it's a short distance, right? So many uh, 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 familiarities there, such an intimacy between you, between Indian audiences of English today, and, and the classical text. There is, there is some familiarity, right? Names of the gods, right? If I encounter in the text Shiva, Hara, Shankara, Abhava, Bhava sometimes, Sharva, right? Kantuhara. Maybe you don't know all the, the, the exact meanings of these fields, but they immediately connect to you with, with a certain god, right? Sometimes each one of these terms has a specific meaning. Shankara. What does he do, Shiva? It's Shankara. Right? What is Shankara? Shankara, right? To do, to do peace. Right? He's the pacifying, pacifying God, Shankara, right? Each one of these are not clear. Not only they're not clear to a non-Indian audience, they don't know that it's the same God. What do you do? You start with a footnote. You put a dictionary at the end of the translation. You know, these are crutches, like we call them crutches. Familiarity with the, 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 the divine mythology. Right? The mythology, the imaginary, the imagination of the gods, their heavens, how they look like. Who is in their family? Right? Parvati, she's also Girija. She's the son of the mountain. Oh, because she was born Menaka, right? Himalaya. All that knowledge is there with you. And when we're translating to outside audiences, we need to take some kind of a leap. Some kind of, we need to take care of those things. Next, cultural idioms, right? We, we had a conversation, Anjali, Anjali, right? What is Anjali? Right? Mm -hmm. you know, we have some kind of a, a, a notion. And I will show you later how challenging it is to translate Anjali to someone who's not familiar with that label, that that label doesn't invoke anything in him or her. And then there are deeper elements that are familiar to Indian audiences, like the plotting devices, like descriptions of nature or descriptions of people, and some certain styles which are familiar here because there is a continuity of culture. For non-Indian audiences, on the other hand, there are a different set of problems, right? First of all, it's not one, in, it's not one audience in, let's assume, North America. I deal with the classroom of undergraduates, that's one. Right? And then I have scholars, they're knowledgeable, right? they have certain critical expectations of, my, of, of, of the translation we're working on. Right? And then there are scholars who are not about India, they're doing sainthood of Christian saints, Muslim saints. I want them to read this as well, I want it to appeal to them as well. We're back to, to square one of, of not being equated with Hinduism. General audience, general readership in North America, who just wants to read these compelling stories. Right? Different audiences, different knowledge. 
So our decision to appeal to these different varied audiences immediately has implications on how we translate. What do we do? What choices we make when we confront all these specific words, sentences, and, and topics more generally? One thing that we constantly speak about, right? Pratime, right? Murti, Vigraha, right? I think it's, it's, it's pretty common here to call them in English idol, tenant, okay? To call them idol. But this is a weird case where English in India is not the same as in, in the North America. If I say idol in a classroom in North America, I'm saying something negative. Idol is idol worshipper. I don't want, I don't want to bring that negative baggage, right? What do I do? I cannot use the word idol for historical reasons of, of Abrahamic religions, right? Do I need to use image? Is image, does image invoke murti? Not quite, right? Does a uh, statue, so such a neutral, dry word, statue, doesn't have the depth, right? So these are the challenges that, challenges that we're dealing with. Anjali, you go to Kittel, one word, right? The cavity formed by putting the hands side by side, hollowing the palms. When the hands in this form are raised towards the forehead, right? It forms the appropriate salutation from inferiors to their superiors. It's such cumbersome, right? Now do that inside the story, right? And then she cupped her hand to mm -hmm. reverend them. And, and we're looking for ways to, to, to convey that, right? If I, if I say, you know, he saluted, saluted can be different things in English, right? It can be a military connotation of salutation, not necessarily veneration and devotion. So these are the kind of challenges that, are, that make up our work all the time. I want to switch now to talk, comes closer to the text about the ragare as a meter and as a text. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, you know, there is always kind of an opening shloka in usually in Kandapadya, and this is where the ragada begins. And we call them couplets, right? They're tied to each other by writing, uh, adiprasa, antiprasa, that ties two of each line together. But, but the bottom line is that with this ragada meter, you don't know where to stop as a reader. You don't know where to stop. It's not a meter, it's not a muktaka, right? It's not a, a, a shatpati or champu, some uh, aksharavrita. No. You don't, you just carry on reading, right? And there are participles and participles. Sometimes there is a finite verb, but the story continues. You don't know where to stop. There is a kind of an ongoing rhythm to Ragadeh, which makes it harder on the translator. And there are other challenges involved in the Ragadeh. By the way, this is a fascinating historical moment. I mean, the fact that a huge work is being written like this, tell us something about the audience in the 13th century that would sit down and listen to this ongoing narration, right? This is a new audience. This is not the audience of Champu. Something has changed in, in, in the clientele of literature in Canada in this moment. But you know, maybe we can speak about it later. So, <clears throat> to add a complexity to that, when you start to read, when you read, you don't know when to stop. You just read the story, unfolds, unfolds you notice something very interesting. You notice that there are shifts in the expressivity. It looks the same, the line's going on. But here, this is Narayana Ramachum, very famous scholars who translated from Telugu a similar meter, and they say the same thing. By the way, this is a period very, very close to Harihara, and the same culture. So there, there is something even going on between Telugu and Canada at this time. Dvipada changes rapidly from song to conversation, from, from fast-paced narration to hymns of praise, incorporating complex syntactic patterns in the ostensibly simple string of couplets. And, and that was unique in Dvipada for Somanata in Telugu, and I would argue it's the same thing with Harihara. There are shifts in the register of the language in the expressivity, but the, the meter stays the same. What do we do that when we translate? To add another complexity, this is from the Basaveshvara Devara Ragalai, these are short lines, but when we reach the 
even chapters, 2, 4, and 6 of the work, and so on, suddenly Harihara switches to prose, right? So whatever decision we're going to make about the translation as prose or meter, we're in trouble, right? Because there is this kind of weird, total stylistic switch between the chapters. And the decision we took finally to cope with these changes is, is I think it's, it's, it's pretty unique. I didn't encounter it much. But what we decided to do is to translate to um, verse lines and prose and to switch between them when we sense that Harihara shifts. When Harihara goes into this burst of description or burst of devotion and there is some kind of patterning some kind of syntax of repetition, we switch to these short lines to convey that. When there is just narrative and details, we switch to prose. This is just a rough example, but um, the examples from here onward that I wanted to show you uh, are exactly that. So this is the original, and this line is, is basically in prose. It continues from before, and here we switch back to prose. But in this section, Right? We try to maintain, and, and this is dense. This is a very dense description of a city, right? And, and, and we wanted to convey the same confusion that we encountered when we read it the first time, right? Delighted by Hara's command, this is the story about Allah Maprabhu, mm -hmm. joyfully descended to the world of humans, right? And now suddenly we switch. So here the change in the form in the English helps us to signal it to the reader. Consider the jewel on earth enthralling to the minds of the community of saints, shining with well-laid and newly built streets facing the moon and the sun, splendid in its beautiful layout dedicated to Sri Achiva. We're talking about a city. We didn't say that yet, right? This city was known as Baligavi, the city of vines, right? And here we continue. And you can notice that here, it's, it, you cannot notice any of these switches. Later in the story, he is actually born as human in, in these verses. <laughs> Bless you. For nine months, her beauty developed the mother pregnant until the baby ready to appear, but awaiting the appointed hour came out at an auspicious moment. Muhurtan. No, Muhurtan, right? This the, how, do we, how do we convey that, right? The appointed moment, Shubhadina, the right day, as was fitting like the sun emerging from the east, like the moon born of the beautiful milky ocean, like a sapling of the celestial wish-giving tree, gracefully taking root on earth. Nirmaya, which is the celestial name of Alaman, was wonderfully born as a child. And now, we're back to prose, then Parvati Ume and Shiva lovingly blessed him. And Naga, Naga Vasa Adipatidas, the father, rejoiced with love. The baby, a personification of the propitious, glowed with beauty. Um, and Alama is growing. What we have here is just running lines. At the naming ceremony, Namakarana, he was giving the name Jagake Allaya, one who rejects the world, which is a synonym for Nirmaya, the undeceived. Nirmaya Niyamba Pesaram right? for the name of Nirmaya. And by the way, this is the first proof, the first historical explanation of Alama's name. I know there are different explanations to Alama for Harihara, Jaga Ke Allah, refusing the world, a renouncer, an ascetic from his birth. He developed as one to be reckoned with, as a near switch to couplet, as a new ornament for Shiva's feet and there's a new moon coming forth from the ocean of devotion. As it grew, and so on. Maybe, now this is, this is a jump. In, in the middle there is an amazing, a beautiful, sensuous section of a love story between Alama and Kamalate. And, and, and they're joined together for years until she suddenly dies, and he's heartbroken. And he goes wandering outside the city, mind weighed down by sorrow, and arrived at Oleander Garden. Sitting down, mind clouded by his thoughts, eyes fixed on the ground in anger, sighing, 
with bowed head, tears falling. He was consumed by despair. In this state, he began to trace streaks in the sand with his feet, when suddenly a little glow flickered there. His curiosity was piqued as the flashing grew stronger. My God, I think it's Hara Hara, Hara, Shiva Shiva. My God, it was like a blossom of Shiva knowledge appearing before him. It was like the tip of the cupola breast of the Lady of Ultimate Liberation. He discovers the, cave, the temple buried in sand. Inside there is a mystic Animisha with a Linga in hand. And this is the beginning of Alama's awakening journey and discovery of the Linga. And the story goes on. But I will stop here. Thank you very much. So, so enjoy that. Uh, I have a simple question. What is the, if, can you make a generalization about the relations between verse and prose in this kind of What is the relation? You know, is there a prose, is there a genre of prosy metro mixed? This seems to be it. Uh, so what's the division of labor between verse and prose? In generally in kind of the literature. Yeah. Let me explain. So yeah, I, 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 I would just say, I would just say Hari Hari is the uh, outlier. He's really exceptional. The more traditional use is obviously the the, the, the older styles of Champo. But um, maybe you mentioned for can say some explanation of that. Oh my gosh, yeah. see in Canada, uh, Champo, it, uh, the literature in Canada, it uh, starts with Champo. And uh, it's really um, an interesting uh, uh, shift from Sanskrit way of dealing with it. In Sanskrit, uh, you write either prose or poetry. <laughs> but in Canada and Telugu, somehow they are interested in uh, multiple meters mixing together with prose. So they thought, see, this narration of any epic needs different ways of expression. So they selected uh, different meters and uh, some of them are for, borrowed from Sanskrit and some of them are from Prakrit, some of them are native meters and also prose. So definitely there is some shift in their expression whenever they use prose in between. So they selected prose and metrical compositions according to the, uh, the, the context which uh, forces them to use them. And also there is, is even in meters also, there are different meters which are used according to the uh, mood of the character. Even so even see, uh, when there is a uh, battlefield and when they are doing it, they use Matte Bhavi Kredita and other meters. And for simple, uh, this thing, pathos, etc., they use Kandata. Yeah? But they know how to uh, convey their feelings in different meters. So, uh, that is so. But uh, here, this problem in Nagale uh, and other this thing, yeah? you have the same flow of metrical composition. But within that uh, metrical, uh, this composition, you have to express different feelings. So we try to recognize what it is, where to use prose, and where to use uh, this, uh, this metrical, uh, this poetic, uh, this thing. Any other questions? In English, uh, normally, the Antyaprasa is followed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In Canada, in this regale, Adiprasa, Antyaprasa, both are there. You didn't try for... <laughs> no, 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 and the challenge is there, the invitation is there, right? The classical uh, 18th century, 19th century English literature, um, dactyle, classical meters, with the rhyming. Uh, I don't, I, 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 I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I think it will be the, the you know, if it's a balance of translation, the prices that we would need to pay to maintain this rhyming would be very high in terms of the accuracy of the translation. That's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, I think there is a, a, a lulling feeling in rhyming that I don't want the reader to go into, actually. I want to keep them, again, you, would, you rightly argue, in the original it is there, right? The, the, the Adi Prasa and Antia Prasa, what was the effect of that, of that Prasa 
for the intended audience in the 13th century? We don't know. There was an effect, I'm sure. I'm not trying to recover that. I'm kind of uh, hedging my bets. And, 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 I think, and I think it's in, a, in, in line with the current trends of, of poetic composition in English anyway. Uh, we, are, we, we have some translations, for example, from Canada to Telugu, Telugu to Canada, and uh, some of them try to do it in the same meter, but it was a failure because they could not convey the feelings of the poet in the same meter in another language. So this uh, end rhymes and all these things. If you give more importance to language rather than the feelings of the poet, then you know, it's a failure. That's why we have to... Okay, for doing that, the translator also should be of the same level as the original author. We're not in the level of Haryana. <laughs> um, the stereotype of a translator into English uh, of Indian classics is that of a native speaker of English. That's been the, largely the tradition and history. Uh, you know, he should be a native speaker of English. Generally, it's a he and a native speaker. And, uh, but I would like to know, uh, what is your own experience? What kind of uh, competence is, uh, you know, like if one can be equally bilingual, perfectly bilingual, then there's no issue. But given who we are, uh, they say there are no perfect bilinguals, right? Therefore, one's ability in one understanding the Indian language vis-a-vis -vis expressing oneself in English. You know, between these two, which do you think is more important for a translator who is doing it into English? Mine is something little bit uh, different angle. You told that uh, one of the reasons of translation is to make it attractive to other people outside India. For example, other things in Greek and German, other stories and other things which have been translated into English has become popular all over the world. Like that, even all this Kanda old uh, Ragale and other thing is being translated so that it will be become something like that. Is it possible? If time is there, I will later ask. Time. One more question. Thank you very much. It was very, very fascinating. And I wanted to follow up on this uh, interesting point that um, you brought up about uh, the fact that the ragale is its form allows you to play with the with the being it being prose or being uh, poetic uh, poetry. So I was trying actually to think what happened in cases in uh, Champu where you find, so usually you, you look at the verses and you think, and you perceive them as being more poetic and the vachanas as being more kind of narrating sense. But there are these unique cases in which the vachanas are very poetic. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you um, attack such occasion? What, what, how much do you let yourself, uh, your poetic uh, um, soul, uh, go with your translation, or whether you keep it the way, the form it was initially? Valamada, uh, this, um, <clears throat> you know, which is the right uh, uh, simile, you know, the, the bird with two wings, right? The, the wing of the Canada and the wing of the English, and they balance each other. I guess there is no uh, strict answer to this. But, but, but I think translations in collaborations are very important. I think that the moment there are, first of all, I mean, David Schumann said it about Sanskrit, but, but, but even for this, texts are meant, especially classical texts, pre-modern, 
they they are they're a group project just to read them, not to translate, just the reading of them, right? Just to sit together to to kind of delve into the meanings, the possibilities, the dangers of mistranslation. All of these things become so much alive in a collaboration. So if there is a collaboration and it's working, I think that's good. I cannot say any more about within what's going on in it, inside it. But it's a very important point, definitely. Um, about uh, the gentleman question, Greek, German. I, obviously, the, 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 there is a kind of a word, right, for, for what you're asking, I, I think. The way I understand the question, the uh, politics, right? the, the politics of translation, right? What are we doing? What is the project, right? Greek has won and earned and historically grew into being the bedrock of what? Of Western culture. You could argue it has some correspondence with Sanskrit poetry. It may, okay, that's a different, that is a totally different story. I am not trying to, uh, you know, I, I, I want to resist the political question. I want to resist. I want, I want to give room for intellectual engagement, curiosity, and humanistic enjoyment in the classroom, outside the classroom, uh, uh, which is open to different readings. I'm not, I know that by that I'm, I'm actually avoiding the problem, right? What is my own project, right? Obviously, we, we scholars who come to, the, to, to India again, we're involved emotionally, experientially, we're involved, right? We are in a complicated moment in history. We are in a complicated age of uh, politics of identity. I, I just want to offer compelling literature to more people. You know, that, that's what I want to say now. Uh, and and, and, and the, last, the last comment about this, and this I will also pass to Mestru, Champu is, is, is more of a, but, but um, um, there is a poetic moment there. There is a poetic personal moment. You know, when you, when you start to translate, any translator will tell you the first 30% of what he translates of the text, he can scrap immediately. Because that first initial encounter with the translation of the text is establishing of translation strategies. You establish them as you go, you try things, and then you develop, on one hand, these are intuitions, they can also be formalized into some kind of policy or some kind of guidelines. When to switch? Oh, right, this is the description, this is emotional, this is the... And we get these cues. But I think in the, in the, in the Champu area, definitely. Uh, uh, this translating or uh, introducing Greek uh, mythology or other things is different from translating, for example, Odyssey uh, and the Greek tragedies. You have translations in Canada and other languages. They are different from just introducing some of the concepts in a language. So even Indian, uh, this uh, Vedas, Bhagavad Gita and many others are translated. They are different from translating Champu or Ragale or other, uh, these classical uh, works. So here, as one of was putting it, uh, how to translate them? Is it, uh, it should be English or Kannada English? That's a uh, really uh, that problem um, occurs whenever you are introducing, uh, for example, Chimpu, Ragali, and uh, different types of uh, Canada classical works. For example, when we are doing Vadaradhan, you cannot uh, just translate it into a simple English introducing the story because it has so many cultural. Uh, the, uh, difficulties, for example, uh, you have this Avadhi Jnana, how to translate it? It's clear why I'm so easy. And there are many other Jaina technical terms which you cannot translate and you cannot convey that uh, uh, meaning in English. So there, the only the alternative is to use the original word and give a glossary of and also even the, um, what do you call this, sentence structure or others. My colleague was saying, you should follow Kannada more than English. 
let them know that the Kannada narrative is like this and the Kannada people talk like this and you have to introduce that uh, uh, aspect also in your life. So this is entirely different from translating Champu where you have a different type of poetic expression. So there you can transform it into English. <laughs> but uh, here in the narratives, especially in Ragali and others, we have to bear in mind that they have a particular type of uh, expression which we have to bring it in uh, English also. Probably the least literary person in this audience would like to ask some comments and questions. I was uh, strongly influenced by what uh, Professor Venkatao said, perhaps in this room, not in this room, the one below, um, late in May and early in June. One of the points he made was that it was more than 30 years after he got to the US that he realized how difficult it was to translate and all that he'd been doing before was utter nonsense. He didn't use those words. And almost implying that a literal translation is not possible, that it has to be a free translation. And connected with that to the other point, which was that much of, and he was talking about Telugu, uh, Professor Sundaram might want to vouch for this, that um, what we can say is approximately authentic is only poetry, that there is no real prose. If there is prose, it's likely to be distorted because there are no real documents in the modern sense of the word that survive from so many hundreds of years ago. And because poetry is poetry, it's more likely to be carried forward more accurately than any kind of prose. Um, looking at some of the things that were shown here, I was quite surprised at the kind of translation. For example, I don't know any Kannada in the real sense of the word, but I do know some Telugu. Gada Yuddham, I have only have translated as dual of maces or dual of the maces, not the dual of the maces. Similarly, um, the veneration of the elders is very different from venerating elders or veneration of the elders. And that's more, much more dangerous because it implies that there's only one way that you can venerate elders. We say the veneration of the elders. Um, one can go on in this fashion. The last point I'd like to make was uh, Professor Benharot, when he was talking about it, making his initial points. I wondered whether what Harihara was saying about Basava is actually correct, in the sense that there were no matas, no all the other institutions that we that modern day Virashaivas associate with Basava, they could be complete distortions, perhaps deliberate distortions. And one needs to go back to Harihara's Radhul <laughs> to um, see if that was the real sense of what Basava was saying. Yeah, uh, my question is this. I've heard a lot of translators talk about the act of translation. Translation is one of loss. Um, is there another way that we can look at translation, not as loss, not as a negative thing, but as a positive or you know, an enriching aspect? Because I think it also ties into a kind of um, conversation we're having today where we look at ourselves as in a place of cultural deprivation. I think it's very problematic. So is there a way we can rethink the act of translation and also that way re-envision this, this larger debate uh, about cultural loss and, and preservation and enrichment? Thank you. There is one translation of Golgotha by Putina. So that is uh, again a poetic uh, translation. So that way, I think Indian languages are more musical, more metrical than the Western languages. Is it so? You know, sort of piggybacking on both these comments or questions, 
I, uh, if, if, if you sort of look around the world, as far as I know, you know, the translations that have really gripped, literary translations that have really gripped local readerships have tended to be what Lawrence Venuti, the theorist of translation, would call domesticating rather than foreignizing, right? So rather than sort of warping the target language to accommodate um, the language you're translating from, you actually domesticate the text completely. And so you think of you know, Edward, Edward Fitzgerald's translation of Umar Khayyam, he barely knew Persian, you know, but the point is he was very, very important for a certain kind of Edwardian England, English poetry, right? Or several others. Um, so, or even uh, A.K. Mehrotra's translations of Kabir, which are translated into kind of American, a very American uh, rap idiom almost, right? Uh, he's not aiming uh, to sort of convey a foreign, distant 16th century text anymore. Anyway. So, um, that might be one way to go, you know, that might be one answer to uh, even Sam's question, mm. uh, which is, mm. you know, you actually, you might lose a lot, but you also gain a great deal through English, because you recover levels of English, and idioms or registers of English um, that any other text might not allow you to do. Right? Uh, only the Raghadeya allow you to do. So that might be one way. Close the discussion after your responses. Uh, is that this? Da, ye, and all this, because it is a very difficult to distinct. And we discussed it with the English process of English. And uh, in Gadaita, both the dual and the basis, both the repartition. So they suggested that it should be the dual of the basis. And here we don't have the veneration. Veneration is common, but veneration with the elders. There also I asked again and again D.A. Shankar and other process, he said, so for uh, elders you should have the. <laughs> Yes, and not from the English. Well, these things are see, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, but it means very different. You differ uh, sometimes. Uh, and uh, uh, Punekar was saying you remove all this uh, uh, everywhere. <laughs> Why do you use so many things? Mm. Um, as for the question of does it get us to the real Basana? I will never make that claim. I think when we read Harihara telling us about Basava, we read Harihara's view of Basava. He apparently lived maybe half a century after Basava. But soon after Basava. Soon. Does that make his depiction more historical? I know it's a temptation. There is a temptation, and I'm constantly struggling with that temptation. We are dealing with a literary representation of a religious tradition with its set of ideologies which are religious, which have their own uh, uh, prescriptions to a community. So there are always ideologies involved. And then we privilege inscriptions. We're saying, okay, literature, we can't believe these guys. Oh, but the inscriptions set in stone. What set in stone? Right? A king, money, public performance, poet. We have to approach all these things with, with some kind of, of, of awareness, just awareness. These are representations, and, 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 and th th there is some recognition involved, which means we don't, we don't have access. We don't have access to the real Basava. What we can have our own Basava, right, inside of us. So, and I think those beautiful comments that all of you made kind of open up the range, right? They change from the negative, negative tone to a positive tone. So much is there, right? So much excitement, creation, creativity is there. Although, I, as, as for your last comment about, I don't think Ariadas, the regulator, do not invoke the same humanistic, spiritual, lyrical inspiration as the Rumi poetry, you know, to, to pick an example. I don't think, I, I don't approach it like that. I, I'm much more historical, and we're in a tight narrative. <coughs> there are moments of, of, of upliftment, but I don't think, I, 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 at least that's not my project, of making Harihara this kind of a source for my own emotional, devotional fans. It's not what, I, what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll close here, but thank you for uh, such serious uh, and thoroughgoing questions. In many ways, Bhakti is uh, a public uh, performance phenomenon. 
and uh, this suggestion that we read old texts together and create publics around old texts, I think, flows in with the sentiment of bhakti as well. So uh, thank you for uh, two wonderful, serious, complex uh, discussions. I hope you will continue to trouble them after we close the discussion. Uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs>